Amen. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 21, David is still on what we may call an exile journey, still running away from King Saul. Perhaps by way of background, we will remember that when God had rejected Saul as the king of Israel, he then sends the prophet Samuel to go and anoint the son of Jesse as the next king. And the son of Jesse that would be anointed would be son number eight, the last born by the name of David. In the anointing of David as king, God makes a profound statement that God does not look at the outward appearance, but God looks into the heart of humanity. From there onwards, we see no link between how David, the young shepherd, will end up in the palace as the ruler of Israel. But let me preface what I'm about to say by saying, when God has purposed for you to achieve something, God has also set out a way on how to achieve it. Look at how David ends up in the palace. Anointed to be king, though he is a shepherd, the Bible says when the Spirit of God entered David, the Spirit of God departed from Saul. And the Bible says Saul was now visited by a distressing spirit. And it happened that Saul's chief of staff at that time knew Jesse and knew that Jesse had a son who was skilled at playing the harp. And so this man says to King Saul, I know a young man who can play for you the harp and perhaps it may soothe you. And so it happened that when David was fetched, he played for King Saul, and indeed King Saul was at peace. But a message arrived. The Philistines were attacking. King Saul immediately released David, told him to go home because war was not for little boys like David. David went home. And when David arrives at home, his father gives him a message and a mission to go and bring resources to his brothers who were now in the battlefield together with King Saul. On his arrival, David found Goliath the Philistine insulting not only the people of God, but their God as well. And it was there that David purposed in his heart is that such a thing was not to be allowed to go on. He challenged, he asked for the opportunity. As a matter of interest, when David arrived, when David asked to fight Goliath, when David tried on the armor of Saul, when David went to the battlefield carrying only the stones and the sling, the Bible is clear. Though he had been playing a harp for Saul, Saul did not recognize him. Now, the Bible says, when David killed Goliath, Saul recognized him. I love that part of the story. It always encourages me. There are people who will never remember us until we kill Goliath. I think one of, sometimes we need to remember we need to kill Goliath for some people to pay attention. And we fight sometimes from the wrong perspective. Maybe instead of asking, why do they not recognize me? Why do they not see my work? Why do they not respect me? Perhaps I would give you different advice today. Go kill Goliath. No one again will ever ask who you are. Kill Goliath. The world will remember you. We spend too much time fighting why people don't respect us. Maybe we must do things that are impossible to ignore. We must do things that are impossible to set aside. The world will remember you 
once you kill Goliath. You may play the harp, the world will not remember. But when you kill Goliath, Saul will remember you. My challenge to all of us, wherever we are watching from this morning, wake up every day, kill your Goliath. Do not worry whether people will remember you. When Goliath is dead, they will know who you are. Our duty is not to fight for people to remember us. Our duty is to execute the mission. Remembrance will follow. When David had killed Goliath, King Saul remembered him. Somewhere throughout this continent of Africa, there is a cry. Why does the world not respect Africa? My answer this morning is simple. We need to stop asking Europeans and Asians and Americans to respect us. We need to get busy with the mission of killing Goliath. When we have killed Goliath, the world will know what and who Africa is, who and what Africans are. We have a mission. The mission from the tip of my home country, Africa, to the northern parts of Egypt and Libya, from the furthest part of West Africa, Morocco, and the sub-Saharan regions, to the far east in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Somalia, and Kenya, there should be one thing that drives Africa. Kill Goliath, and the world will know who we are. That should be the mission echoed in every classroom, in every university, at every pulpit, in every summit, in every church, in every farming field, in every military camp, in every police station. Let Africa be united by one call. Kill Goliath and we shall achieve our standing among the nations of this world. But the message is also true for the churches as well. We are given a mission to kill Goliath. My brothers and sisters, the strength of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not in criticizing what other churches are doing. It's in killing the Goliath in our mission. If we want the world to know what Adventism stands for, it is very simple. Every Adventist preacher, missionary, and gospel worker must wake up to kill the Goliath that is in our mission. Every Catholic, every Methodist, every Muslim, you have but one duty. Kill Goliath in the mission that God has given you. We spend too much time preaching against each other's denominations. That will not achieve God's mission. We must kill Goliath. And our Goliath is very simple. Our Goliath is a sin that easily entangles and the sin that disrupts the plan of God in our lives. We have a mission. Kill Goliath. From the tip of South Africa to the northern parts of our continent, in every office, in every job, Africans are crying. Why am I not getting promoted? Why am I not being given the bigger projects? My brothers and sisters, even at a personal level, you have to understand, kill Goliath where you are. In the family, kill Goliath. Everyone will know your standing the day you kill Goliath. The Bible says, when David killed Goliath, Saul remembered him that he was the boy who had been playing the harp. As I wrap up this message, this young David would go out to conquer many great wars. And because of this, Saul would realize that it is this David who has been anointed by God to replace him. And so their battle began. Saul wanted to kill David. In 1 Samuel 21, David gives us a few lessons that I would like us to share with each other, particularly as African Christian professionals 
where we work to be more than just professionals, for our jobs to be more than just professions, for our jobs to actually tap at a level where they move from careers to callings, from jobs to life-changing uh, 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 methods. How do we get there? I believe 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1 to 9, sets the pace. How do we get there? How do we become more than professionals, more than professions, more than speakers, more than pastors, more than doctors, more than nurses, more than teachers, more than accountants. How do we wake up to become more? David teaches me a few steps in becoming more. And this is what David says. In 1 Samuel 21, David is now running away from Saul. It was a Sabbath. He left his 600 soldiers. David had 600 soldiers. And the Bible says he left them at a particular place. He went to Nov, where there was a temple, and the Levites lived there. And Ahimelech was the priest presiding there. When David arrives, listen to this very carefully. The Bible says, when the priest Ahimelech saw him, he trembled. He trembles and says, why are you here alone? What is the problem? You see, David was the general of the army of Israel. Ahimelech was not aware that David and Goliath uh, and Saul were now enemies. He doesn't know that. As far as he knows, there is peace in the country and J David is a faithful general to King Saul and King Saul loves David, his general and son-in-law. So, when the priest saw the general traveling alone, the priest was troubled. Lesson number one, when David appeared, his appearance commanded attention, reaction, and respect. This is a challenge that I want to pose to many of us. Does our presence move anybody? It is very unfortunate that many of us call ourselves Christians. Nevertheless, evil does not tremble in our presence. Evil continues in our presence. In fact, it is sad to say some of the most corrupt politicians are faithful Christians in our continent. Some of the most corrupt churches are led by pastors in all denominations, Seventh-day Adventists, Roman Catholics, Methodists, Pentecostals, Evangelicals. There is corruption led by the clergy throughout Africa. It is said that the demons have no reason to tremble either in our presence nor in our prayers because the truth be told, we are their colleagues more than we are servants of God. If we are going to change Africa, we need to find leaders in the presence of whom there is a clear shadow of dignity, honor, respect. And how do we do this? We do not begin when a person is already a member of parliament, a president of a country, a minister, a judge, a pastor, a member of the African Union. No, my dear brothers and sisters, we must begin challenging the clarity, cleanliness, and purity of character from childhood. We must begin drilling into our children that where a Christian is, evil must be afraid. Where a child of God is, evil must know that it is not welcome. We have 
with regret. Police officers who are busy with bribes, but they are elders of churches. It cannot happen. If we are going to change Africa, we must also challenge the moral standing of those who claim to be followers of religions. This is not only a message for Christians. We must challenge Muslims. We must challenge Muslims and make it clear that in the name of Allah the Almighty and in the name of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, let there be no evil administered by Islam. Let there be no evil administered by Christianity. Our religions must be worth their salt in Africa. But not only Christianity, not only Islam, not only Judaism. We must challenge African traditional religions as well. We must say to African traditional religions, stop assisting politicians to kill each other. Stop supplying muti for witchcraft and juju and voodoo. You must play your role. If you say your, your religions are good, let them also stand up their ground and refuse to supply evil in Africa. Whether it is in a church, a mosque, a, a forest, let all spirituality in Africa be united in this one thing. That evil cannot stand where good exists. But this challenge resonates even more for us who are in Christ Jesus. It cannot be that our Lord and Savior died to raise the flag of righteousness. But Christians are found promoting evil. If you are David, when you show up, let Abimelech tremble. Why? Because your character is known for honesty, integrity, goodness. That must be the fear we command wherever we appear. I say it again. A Christian cannot show up and it is business as usual. Then something is wrong with your faith. Something is wrong with your spirituality. When evil is happening and no one is feeling any different in your presence, there is something that is not kosher in your spirituality. When David showed up, Abimelech reacted. The world must react at the presence of Christians. Secondly, when David realizes is that Abimelech does not know what is happening. Listen to this, my dear brothers and sisters, very carefully. David does not say, well, I don't know if you are aware, Mr. High Priest, but me and Saul, we are fighting because God has ordained me to replace him. That is not what happened. When David realized that the priest does not know what is happening, he protected the innocence of the priest. And that is the second aspect I want to raise to all of us today. Good leaders, good leaders are those who can protect innocent people from any challenges that will harm them. You see, David realized that Abimelech does not know the truth. So what does David do? He protects Abimelech. He does not want to divide. He does not want the priests to choose between the current king and the incoming king. When you are leading people, always fight on principles, but never ever dirty the waters. You see, we live in a world where some people are so desperate to be in power, they are not only prepared to use innocent people, but they are prepared to kill them as well. In Africa, in Europe, in Asia, 
in South America and in America. Millions have died in wars which were to serve the purpose of a minority that wanted power. How many millions have died around the world in order for two or three individuals to pursue their ideologies? One of the reasons why I love Jesus as my Lord and Savior is that he becomes the greatest leader for me. Why? Instead of commanding others to die for his cause, he died for his cause. I wish Hitler had taken the gun and fought his own cause. I wish George W. Bush had taken the gun to fight his own cause. Tony Blair should have done the same. Idi Amin should have done the same. We need to be very clear. When a leader draws their strength, at the expense of innocent lives, such a leader is ungodly. Even in our churches, we see leaders who are not prepared to stand for principle. They are quick to draw the masses into the politics instead of dealing with the principles of what we are doing. My brothers and sisters, I must challenge as well and commend what has been happening here at Uplift. Yes, Uplift is a project that is run by a non-governmental organization, CAM. CAM was established by Adventists. This is true. But CAM is not a denomination. Uplift is not a denomination. Uplift is a powerful spiritual movement to transform thinking in Africa. Yes, the founders of this organization draw from their Adventist teachings in order to influence the world. However, come is not a branch of a church organization. It is important we say this so that you understand when we stand on this pulpit, we are not just speaking to our Adventists who know us, we are addressing the whole continent and indeed the world for the influence of the gospel in the transforming of the mind so that Africa may be liberated in its entirety. We are not here to play the politics of the Adventist church or the Catholic church or the Methodist church. We are here to speak to Africa on God's mission and mandate for the gospel to transform our people in all of Africa. Leaders must be wise. Do not bring petty politics into a powerful principle that we are trying to do. We do not stand on these pulpits for petty politics. God has put in our heart a burning fire for the gospel of Jesus to be felt on the tables of Africa, in the universities of Africa, in the bank accounts of Africans, in the books of Africans, in the cell phones of Africans. Our mission is bigger than establishing denominations. We are building the kingdom of God for the glory of God in our African context. Leaders must be wise. Do not drag the innocent into your battles. By the way, Saul killed these priests after he heard David was there. Now you can see who is a stupid leader. One protected them, the other one killed them. Wherever God has stationed you, at school, in church, at work, Never be divisive. Never fight your battles by monopolizing the currency of human resources. In everything you do, fight with principle, for principle, by principle. Fight with ideas, transformation, thinking, and implementation. Not through gossip, slander, character assassination, belittling, assaulting, 
killing. That is not the way of the children of God. It is the way of the prince of darkness and his followers. David teaches us always protect the innocent. As we wrap up the message, now David says to Abimelech, is there any bread for us to eat? Abimelech says, I don't have any bread that ordinary people may eat. What is there is bread that is holy. In the book of Leviticus, God told the Levites to bake bread. Put that bread in the sanctuary. Keep it there. Why? There was a miracle. They were supposed to change the bread at the beginning of every Sabbath. However, what did they discover? When they walk in with the new bread, they would find the old bread still warm and steaming. Why? It was a sign because the bread represented the proof that God shall always provide and his blessings shall never expire. So they would take out the bread and eat it. Now, that bread was only for Levites. Abimelech says, I can't give you the bread, but there's a critical verse that I want us to read. In chapter 22, 1 Samuel 22, verse 10, there's a verse there that we must bring back to chapter 21. This is what it says. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Now let's go back to chapter 21. How? How could Ahimelech give David holy bread? Chapter 22 verse 10 answers us. Ahimelech actually went to God first and asked, Is it right to give? David, holy bread. It is God who replies and says, test him. If he is holy, give it to him. If he is not, do not give it to him. Now Ahimelech comes out. I love Ahimelech. His test was a very strong and practical one. What does Ahimelech know? Ahimelech knows soldiers spend a long time away from home. That means soldiers are very unfaithful to their wives for many reasons. Some soldiers rape as part of dealing with their post-traumatic stress disorder of killing. Some soldiers meet prostitutes. Some soldiers fall in love with the new women. So Ahimelech tests them in a very relevant way. He says, have you and your men been holy? Have you kept yourselves from women? Listen to Ahimelech very carefully. Women in Ahimelech are not unholy. He says, have you been holy? Have you and your men kept yourselves from women? In other words, Ahimelech is asking, as you and your army have been moving, you met women. Some were prostitutes. Some loved you. Some were this or that. That is immaterial. Ahimelech wants to know, when you saw them, did you see the holiness of God? Did God's presence keep your minds straight? Listen to Ahimelech. Ahimelech is not arguing whether the women were clothed or naked, whether they were wearing short skirts or long dresses. Why am I saying this? Because today, many men want to use women as an excuse for their morality. 
Look at how they dress. What are we supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? You are supposed to take control of yourself. Ahimelech is clear. The type of women you met doesn't matter. The question is, were you holy? My brothers and sisters, holiness is not circumstantial. You don't become holy because the situation agrees. Oh, I am holy because the woman is wearing a long dress. I am holy because the man did not offer me money. I am holy because they did not give me a bribe. No. Holiness is holiness precisely because you were offered the benefits of unholiness, yet you chose to be holy. In fact, I love David's answer. David says, Say, we have kept ourselves away from women. Then these are the two things I love. And me and my men, we have been holy even when the missions were not holy. Now David hits the point. Holiness is not determined by your environment. He says we were holy even when the missions were not holy. If we are going to change Africa and the world, we need to start teaching holiness is not circumstantial. Holiness is a principle. You don't become holy because your wife is around. You become holy regardless of the type of mission you are in. What am I saying? I am saying God is looking for pastors who will go and do a week of prayer, a camp meeting, a crusade. And when they get there, they serve the living God. They keep their zip closed. They baptize and they go home. No zip opened. With no excuse, what was I supposed to do? I was three weeks away from home. Holiness is not circumstantial. God is looking for businessmen and women who will refuse to pay a bribe. Why? Holiness is not circumstantial. We must destroy in Africa this phrase, what was I supposed to do? This is how business is done. If you don't pay a bribe, you won't get the work. No! If the army of Christians would rise in every part of this continent and say, we will bribe no one. We will bribe no police officer. We will bribe no government official. Let me tell you, we would change the mood in the continent. We would make it embarrassing, shameful to pay a bribe. Why? Holiness is not determined by circumstances. Holiness is determined by our characters. My brothers and sisters, we must remain holy even when the missions are not holy. It is the only way we will convert what we do into a calling for changing our countries. Let every teacher be holy. Every nurse, every policeman, every pastor, every politician, every street sweeper, every builder, plumber, electrician, videographer, sound engineer, wherever you are, be holy. Even if the missions you are on are unholy, we can change Africa. If we stop making holiness a circumstance and we make Holiness, a rule of life. I am very hopeful that even before Jesus comes again, if Africa will have experienced a great taste of what it means to be true servants of God.
Holiness. Holiness. Wherever you are watching from, I want to challenge you today. Do not conform to the standards of this world, but be renewed by the presence of the Holy Spirit in your mind. Holiness is not an option. I want to challenge every Christian in this continent, wherever you are. You are a Christian, you are a street sweeper, you are a teacher, you are a judge, you are a lawyer, you are a police officer, you are a pastor. Wherever you are, please heed my voice. It is your time. It is your time to convert your profession to a calling by becoming holy in all circumstances. We need holiness in our parliaments. The parliament of Ghana, the parliament of Kenya, the parliament of Nigeria probably have the highest number of Christians in them. These are Christian foundational states. But the corruption reports declare something different. There is a problem. Christianity has become a scam in Africa. False raising of the dead. False miracles. Stealing of money and resources. We see it everywhere. My dear brothers and sisters, if you believe in Jesus and call upon him, as your Lord and Savior, and you are filled by the Holy Spirit. This morning, wherever you are, I want to challenge you as I send out this call. God is looking for men and women who will be faithful to duty as the needle is to the pole. The time has come. No more excuses. No more circumstantial holiness. No more I would have, but no more you see in my country it is. No more well I would have liked it too, but my church is. No more the truth is I agree, but as a young person I am. No, no more excuses. David says we remained holy even when the missions we're not holy. So, from Monday, you return to an unholy environment. You work in an unholy office, an unholy school, an unholy company, an unholy court. It doesn't matter where you are. Holiness will not be defined by the circumstance. The time has come for holiness to define everything else. I challenge all of us, all of us, to be a faithful husband must not happen because there are no naked women. With a naked woman in front of you saying, I want you, I have loved you for years, pick up the blanket, Cover her. Tell her, my sister, I will be in heaven with you one day. And it begins here right now. When we treat holiness as a principle, not as a circumstance. Holiness must be spoken to our offices of power. In my country, I preach against corruption. I do not fear my president. I come from a country where there are people who kill you when you speak out too much politically. That's not my concern. I have decided that if death is the price to pray, to pay for transforming of Africa, I think I am prepared to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, to die for what I believe in. We cannot all be cowards. We can't all say, if I speak, they'll kill me. We must speak. But the truth is not only for politicians and fornicators. The truth must be spoken to our church leaders, Seventh-day Adventist church leaders, 
Methodist church leaders, Muslim church leaders, no one is so holy that the finger of God cannot point and say, repent. If we are going to change this continent, we must infuse a new software. Holiness is not an option. Holiness is our standard. Let us pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, one thing we pray for, let your holiness be felt in our continent and in our lifetime. From the home to the marketplace, the school, the university, the church, the streets, the stadiums, the offices, the farms, the mines, the airplanes, in the oceans, let your holiness be clearly revealed. We need, we need your Holy Spirit to use us to set an example of your holiness wherever we are. I am asking in the name of Jesus that let your holiness be the motto of our existence now till that day we see you come in the clouds. For we have prayed in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.